morning. Still Hello. Hasn't gone, has it? Now, been? for anybody that may be watching us from abroad, just bear with us for a minute because we're just going to have a wee trip down memory lane. It's a little bit of nostalgia. We will come back to the news because today was the very, marks 50 years of the very first day of some mothers do have them. Ooh, oh, right. Betty. Go straight in. My. To cheer everyone up. Yeah. I think so. It's funny, isn't it? It's, it's not, although it had such an impact. This is a, a welcome everyone. Good morning, coffee morningers. If you're listening on podcast, welcome everyone. Um, hi everyone. Um, yeah, it had a huge impact in the 70s, didn't it? But it's not, if I'm honest, it's not a show I think of as the golden era of comedy. Really? Not at all. Oh, my God. Maybe that's our age difference. Maybe. I mean, I thought it was very funny. Ooh, be Betty. What was it? So anybody that's never seen it, the main character, extremely talented man, Michael Crawford, and we didn't know at that point he could sing, did we? No. I, couldn't, no. I, could I never always make thought he was Michael Ball. I couldn't make the crossover to the singing. I just, I, I, I was, he was totally typecast for me forever. Was he Phantom of the Opera? We used, it was appointment to view in our house and we'd all watch it together and we would do the impressions. Dina's impression is fantastic. It's my sister Dina. Mm. And it was just true, brilliant slapstick. It reminds me again a bit of you. You know how, mm. like I say, you're like Michael Barrymore in the way you throw yourself around. Mm. Well, he has that. For me as well. I mean, mm. everything he did would go wrong. He was like, he yeah. was the genius at clumsy slapstick. And he did all his own stuff. He was sort of like Tom Cruising before Tom Cruise was even a speck in the eye. Yeah. Wasn't he? I yeah. mean, he would do some, they were really dangerous stunts. They were really dangerous stunts. But he was like, he was like, oh, Betty. And really? he had a raincoat and a French beret. He's a bit Norman Wisdom. I mean, how nuts was that? Very tall, very skinny. Yeah, yeah. And then you had this gorgeous wife who was just always a little bit put out yeah. by him. Oh, and they just maintained. She was the most... Cats do a whoopsie in the garden. Cats do a whoopsie in the garden. It's very odd. It was so odd. You can actually this break is... it down. Into when the... I was breaking it down today, I was thinking it was so odd. Wasn't it? I feel like I really now want to see one just to see what, yeah. what it was like because it was odd. It was, it was strange. Odd. Cats and whoops in the garden. I mean, I used to say that all the time as a child, not <laughs> really knowing what I was talking about. And my granddad would look aghast. Like, oh, Betty, the cats and the whoops in the. It was like this whatever. thing, perfectly like normal, like housewifey wife who just. Who what was put, the suggestion? Do you know what? Mm. For her to play how Straight. much she loved him, oh, yes. she was yes, brilliant. That's true. that's true. Always look to the straight man for somebody that is really funny. They are so important. That's you and the curly cooks, then, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Weirdly, I the play straight straighter. Guy. Yeah. I play straighter because Dina is very funny. So yeah. I'm, I'm like that. I'm that person that can step back. I can step forward and be funny, but I can step back to. To, to you know to uh, to allow the funnier person to be funny, and um, she she is a very she was a very funny actress of course. But that bit when he was holding onto the bus with the roller skates, yes, do you remember that? Yes, I mean it's funny as you say though. I remember a particularly elaborate one with a ladder. I mean, okay, two things that kind of spring to mind Slapstick. as I now try to unpack some mothers do have them. Slapstick's brilliant. One, he clearly had ADHD. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All these brilliant comedians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But also his character, too. Was the title suggesting he was a bit challenged? Some mothers do have them. Like... Oh, I don't know. You know, sort of a bit... But, I mean, when you think back, he played it like that. But he was also... He had the kindest heart. Didn't he? He was just such a lovely mm. person. So I think, if anything, the message that they were giving was that, you know, don't judge a book by its cover because he was this incredibly kind person. Yes, yes. But I, I just loved it. What's your favourite flash memory of, of him, guys? It was his cat. I think mine is that. It? it was his cat. I think mine is that on the bus. Yeah. And then he gets, and then he lets go of the bus and the bus came. <laughs> yeah. Oh, who's the other one? The fly man. What's his? Rowan Atkinson. Yes. I think Rowan Fine. Atkinson yes. came from yes. Some Mothers Do Have Them. Yeah. Well, I mean, so much slaps. And, and he, yeah, yeah. No, he, he was good. It was odd, though, wasn't it? He was sort of... Yeah, he became a singer. Did he become... Did he sing Phantom of the Opera? Yeah. He was, a, 
he was the he was the Phantom of the Opera. Star wasn't he? of Phantom, the Phantom of the Opera. Phantom of the Opera. Opera. I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't make the crosser. Yes, he did have a baby. They did. They had a baby. That's right. The baby's done a whoopsie in the. What was the baby called? Pete. Roller skates. Yeah, the roller skates. Yeah. Anyway, um, Mark didn't really want to do this today. No, 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 he still it? doesn't. <laughs> no, 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 it's not I didn't want to do it. It's just, I, I suppose I just had not thought. I mean, I think of great, when I think of the comedies of the early 70s, because 50 years ago, that's 72, isn't it? 73. Um, I think of Porridge. I think of um, The Good Life. Um, so I was about eight when it started. Yeah. So the I suppose from birds. a child. Do you remember the live of oh, birds? Oh, I loved the live of birds. Loved it. Do, 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 loved them. Do, do, oh, Jessica. The baby was called do, 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 Jessica. Do, 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 do. That's right. Um, oh, what was the one with the two people? Jessica. Robin and... What was it? Robin... Robin's, Robin's Nest. Nest. With Ty Tessa Wyatt. I loved Robin's Nest. We talked Nest. about this the other day. Tessa Robin's Wyatt, Nest. and she was married to Tony Blackburn. Do you remember we talked about this the other day? No. He broke down on air I when did. she left him. No, oh, Tony Blackburn did. He was crying, and there was a great big furore about it that he shouldn't have cried on his show at the time. Does you anyone remember that? I don't that? remember us talking about that at all. But anyway. Um, D Silverfield, my first ADHD meds today. Wish me good luck. Well, good what luck. I would say is... Good luck. First of all, drink lots of water because you can... You, you you really will get so thirsty. And don't be frightened about that. It settles down. Oh, God, the goodies. The goodies. The Lightly Lads. Oh, I love the Lightly Lads with James Bolam. Bolam. I worked with him years yeah. later on second. Je yeah, the Lightly Lads. What was the... Uh, love thy neighbour. See, I never got on with In Sickness and In Health. Oh, with James Bolam? No, with Alf Garnett. Do you remember? He was always yes. swearing. I yeah, never got, I didn't like... There was something about it. I didn't, and the other one, which was um, where they were in the knacker's yard with the old yes. guy, and I found oh, it a I bit didn't repulsive. Like that. He was too disgusting. Yeah, but it was a bit... I don't know. There was something about it that was a bit weird. A bit unsavoury. A bit unsavoury. I have to say, if I, go to, if I have a go-to favourite, it's porridge. Yes. It is so... Faulty Towers. And Faulty Towers. Yeah. Brilliant. Shine on Harvey Moon. Steptone Sun. Thank you, Julia. Steptone that's, that's Sun. Brilliant. That's it. I, I can never get on with Steptone Sun. I like the live birds. My nan loved the live birds. Mm. It was so. What was the name of the actress who then went on to play the midwife? What was her name? She was great. But anyway, and then the mad one with the curly hair. I loved her. She was yeah. nuts. Okay, so very, very British uh, coffee moaning this morning because we're now going to move on to Anton Dubeck. Um, this is the judge on Strictly Come Dancing, obviously ballroom dancer, presenter. You've worked with him met him many, many times. Um, I, I, I've I worked with him, yeah. I just want to say one couple of things before, because uh, obviously you, you, you don't know him very well. Can I just say one thing, though? You don't, you don't need to know who he no, is. No, no, that, no, no. That's no. the thing, if you are watching from abroad. But he's done an interview. This is the relaunch of Kate Garraway is now doing the show, I think, that Piers Morgan used mm. to do, is that right? Life mm. Stories. And he, he, it's an interview with him, and he's a judge. Now... I, Years ago, I would have, if you'd have asked me 10 years ago, what do you think of Anton de Beck? I'd have just cast my eyes upwards and gone, oh, bloody, really come dancing, how weird. I'm telling you right now, I have, with each year that goes by, I like this man more and more and more. I find him funny, I find him warm, I find him smart, I find him kind, and he absolutely knows how to entertain in an old-fashioned way yeah. in a modern world. He's got an old-fashioned But vibe. in a modern world, yeah. he sits well in a modern world. And so I like Anton de Beck. And the amount of women who say, celebrities that say, I could only do Strictly if it was with Anton. Anton. Honestly, over and over again, and I would be the same, the only way I would ever do Strictly if it was with, if it was with Anton. Um, and so many people feel like that. And he is... You know, he's been on Loose Women multiple times, yeah, always 100% like charming, yeah. always um, engaging and fun. Mm. And and I was incredibly Gentle moved empty. when he had his children. He had his children late in life, mm. twins. And I remember saying to the Loose Women, I have never met anyone that is so joyful about being a father. Yeah. It was genuine joy. And whenever you see, all he wanted to do, once he had his kids, that's all he wanted to talk about Bless as him. an interviewee. Yeah. And, you know, and it's just, just beautiful. 
And Which is you, probably why I wasn't interviewed so much, because there's nothing more no, no, uninteresting no, no, than no, your own children to other people. No, but he's so engaging when he <laughs> no, talks about No, I'm joking, about I've been something. So, um, yeah, and he's a great dancer and all these things. And he, he loves his mother very much. His mother is Spanish. His mother is Spanish. And he talked about his mother and how much I he loves his mother. And his father's Hungarian. Yeah, so he's, yeah. 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 Um, but in Kate's st stories, he, he was talking about his childhood and he has never mentioned this before. Family and friends don't even know this. Um, although he had spoken before that his father was very tough with him and would beat him with a belt and mm. this, he, he, he he tells this just heartbreaking story. Well, he actually story. says, shall I read what he says? He says, yeah. speaking of uh, an incident when he was much younger, he got stabbed in the leg and the stomach on Boxing Day. Um, he says, I got stabbed in the leg and the stomach because of a fight on Boxing Day and it was an idiotic situation. I remember walking out of the house to walk up to the hospital holding my leg and a police car drove past and I waved them down and I said, he's in there with a knife. They carted him off. I ended up in hospital for three or four days. My only concern was getting back into the studio and dancing uh, and the embarrassment of it. And part, you know, part of this, the rages that he encountered courtesy of his father, who but, was so, a, so an this alcoholic, was his, yeah, yeah, his yeah. father stabbed him, was all the accusations of him being gay and being a sissy and his dancing. His father was clearly, you know, obviously toxic masculinity with a capital mm. T and X. Mm. Um, and, and so to, to be stabbed by your own father, and he spent time in hospital, a few days in hospital, didn't he? And his mm. father wasn't charged. Nothing happened to his father. And uh, really why this interest is, not only because he's such a lovely man and I had no idea he'd been through that kind mm. of hell, you know. So we were talking this morning, weren't we, about... Mm people's private hell. Yeah. We never know people's stories. No. And um, also from the POV of, you know, Mark's sure. sober for 18 years and sober one day at a time in a, as I always say, in a drink obsessed world is very tough. Mm. But the rewards, when somebody talks like this in the public eye about the horror the terror of growing up with an alcoholic parent who is often, can be, perfectly nice when sober and a complete nightmare when Hyde. drunk. Jekyll and Hyde. Every time somebody in the public talks like this with such honesty, mm. they help. They help. Well, they give a voice to so many they people. They give a voice conversations happen. I said to Mark again today, you know, your sobriety, look what you've done for your children. You know, with these conversations come up. If you are an adult child mm. of an alcoholic, and I love the way they call it an adult child, mm. because the child is still in their suffering. Mm. And you don't think that your story is worth anything. It is. And if you think, there's no point in you getting support for what you went through. There is. Mm. It follows you right through your life if you've grown up in that kind of atmosphere. It's fucking scary. And the amount of courage it takes to get through each day. So I just wanted to say that for, you know, for, you never know, there could be somebody just today that's just still suffering so much from what they went through with their alcoholic parent and... There is a great um, uh, group called Ad a Adult Children of Alcoholics, and it might be worth you just checking mm. them out. Mm. I, I mean, one part of the story that I think is really... I mean, there's, there's the obviousness of, if you like, uh, you know, any story or telling of these stories um, is an important... You know, lots of people go on about, oh, do we have to hear about it? Oh, why do we do that? Mental health, it's always ever... You, if one person is helped or felt made to feel not mad or alone or insane or isolated in what they're going through, if someone goes, oh, my God, I don't need to, and this is the important thing, but I don't need to feel shame because you will feel, he will have felt shame Children all his life. Shame. And one of, one of the most important things he says, he goes on to say in this is, he, he was embarrassed to reveal this to people. He even mm. says in the interview, and bless me, this, this was the moment where as a kind of, you know, if I was in group therapy with, with him, I'd have said, absolutely. He said, you know, perhaps I've talked too much about it already, or perhaps I've said more than I should, and I don't know why I'm crying about this. You know, it's that stiff upper lip, you know, and, and that's where 
the heartache and the danger resides. Faith Goodman, you've made a really important point there that what, even more wow that he's such a fabulous father. And yeah, exactly. I would go so far as to say it will be because of that experience. Certainly for me, the importance of being a father comes from not having had one. And, it, you know, me wanting to double down on, and you could argue sometimes almost trying to over double down on being a good father. So but it, in many regards, not having a father for me will, will be a huge part of fueling my sobriety because a huge part of my sobriety is making sure I can be sober for my kids. And I think, you know, for anyone who's on their own, feels they haven't got a voice, doesn't have anyone they can talk to, they see someone like him. And what I think is so important is someone as show busy, shiny floor entertainment y mainstream as him is crucial. Because you don't, you know, it's not a surprise if you go online to, a, to an influencer who, or a, an Instagram account which is dedicated to this kind of content, so, so the living. Is, it's so powerful you what he's I mean? done. Yeah, it's yeah. so powerful. And just on that, Mark, because I think it's a really important point. When you, are, when you are growing up with an addict, you learn to keep quiet. Mm -hmm. So that keeping quiet, covering for the addict is enormously stressful and it can follow right through the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. and, and when Mark went to rehab, I, I, you know, the whole thing about getting everything out, talking about how you covered for your partner. So say I might, whatever I might have said to cover the fact that he'd been drinking. When Mark went to rehab, everyone was like going, why? Because nobody really knew he was an alcoholic mm. because everything was kept secret. And so I hope as well, there might be somebody listening here right now that's in that situation. Mm. You know, the ripple effect of somebody sharing their story and then the ripple on and on is so powerful. And I just, and I just, I just, I've always thought what an extraordinary person he is, yeah. Anton, and I, I double that today. Absolutely. Granny Scarlett, um, I can count the amount of times having a drink in front of a daughter on one hand. I could never do it to her. Lee, absolutely. Lee Durrant, people say to me all the time, why do you go on about your mental health? My reply is, you don't know who's listening. Exactly. And if you touch one person, that's why it's always good to be the doing ripple it. On effect. Absolutely ripple. Jamie Kilburn, uh, with my father's alcoholism, it was all emotional abuse, especially to my mother. Um, Shame, shame, shame. And just on that point, on that point, re-alcoholism, drinking and everything else, I'd go so far as to say, and I think there's a whole chat to be done about this, it's crucial, I would say, to most people's recovery that you are, when I say called to task or kind of, you know, held to, what's it kind of, held to, whatever the phrase is, you know, held to, held to account for what and how you've presented to those loved ones. I think... A lot of people, understandably, we want to shy away from that because it's very difficult as you've got sober, you're getting your feelings back, you've drunk because you don't want to face this stuff. Unless you do that, it doesn't mean it's a guarantee, but that is, was, that is a hugely crucial part, that open, honest ability of loved ones and you to be able to share and talk to each other and actually say in no uncertain terms, this is how you left me feeling, this is how you've hit me, this is how you've affected me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's only at that point that you can, in a sense, you have to push the addict in a safe setting, like rehab or therapy, deeper into their rock bottom to absolutely face the cold face of horror that they can then turn around. Because for as long as you haven't faced that cold face, you'll always be holding on to those little bits and bobs and thinking, you know, oh, shame, guilt, can't share. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's really important. So again, I, what, what I suppose what I'm trying to say is, for me, I think this is really significant for him as a person because he's done this in a public setting and it's mm. come out. And, and, you know, yeah, so it would really have good. been a big deal for him because now that yeah. would be a secret it's kept for a long time. So. Absolutely. Yeah. <sighs> that was heavy, suddenly, in a good way, though, in a good way. Mm. Anton de Beck, I do like him. And look, look out, and yet more proof that you can go through all that and be brilliantly entertaining. Mm. I love and that. an amazing father. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is another story. This story really struck me today in the photographs as well. This is a vegan influencer, Russian vegan influencer, who's died of starvation and exhaustion after living off raw fruit diet. Um, Russian Zana Samsonova had been living in Southeast Asia eating exclusively raw vegan diet consisting of fruit, sunflower, seed sprouts, fruit smoothies and juices for the past five years. What I find odd about this is I would... I was surprised that she did struggle on that diet. 
But this, then you were, then you mentioned. But then there's also the dry fasting. How long did she not drink water for? Oh. Now, the, 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 first of all, what a terribly sad situation. Yeah. It's just so awful. Now, her mum is saying she died of a viral infection, um, but you know, there, there's lots, there's lots of discussion about this, and 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 I, I just think moving away from her particular mm, story. Mm, mm that we do have to be so mindful of wellness gurus mm. who ask you to remove one after another food group. Now, she calls herself a vegan. You know, my sister Dean is a vegan. She's there. She is unbelievably healthy. Mm. This isn't about veganism. This is about, as far as I'm concerned, from what I've read that she eats and the way that she looks, it's starvation. Mm. It, it really is. It's starvation. Mm. And these days, everybody is so careful. I mean, on telly, I know that we have to be so careful about mm. what we say. And I really love that so many celebrities now will not discuss how they lost their weight when yes. they lost weight because they don't want people yeah. to then take that on. And, and mm. you know, people are very susceptible to... Um, you know, to, to, to these sorts of suggestions. And I, I've got a friend, actually, whose sister... Um, is anorexic and had, you know, gone into a rehab for her anorexia mm. and then came out and was doing really well and then started, it was the thing of then, I'm vegetarian, then it was veganism mm. and then it was raw fruit and I remember us having a discussion about it and saying, so it, it's anorexia again mm. then. It's just removing whole groups being super healthy. And it's one of the things to watch out for with your kids. I was talking to an um, <clears throat> anorexic spe specialist, eating disorder specialist. It's one of the things to watch out for if your child, because your child comes to you and say, oh, I'm wanting to get really healthy and mm. start off by doing smoothies and then da 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 da, -da. Mm. And, and because there's so much of this online. And then before you know it, yeah. there's so many food groups that have been taken out that mm. actually there's no way that mm. they can be properly nourished. So, yeah, beware. beware. Vill Villanelle 4140 says, watch out for fake gurus. I mean, I, I can think of countless people I've come across in my life who have, have done something which I would say is, is, is almost more frustrating than that, is if you were to tackle the topic and now, you know, you never go head on to someone and suggest that they have an eating disorder. You never go, oh, I think you, have you ever thought that you might, eat? it's just catastrophic. <laughs> like going up to an alcoholic whilst exactly. they're in the middle of their yeah. drinking going, well, I think you need to stop right now. And it's like, you're going to get hit. But the amount of people I have met in my life who have hidden quite palpable, chaotic relationships and deeply corrosive relationships and self-damaging relationships with food behind this firewall, which is quite aggressively presented, which is one of, I'm on this diet, I'm eating healthily, this is, you know, and this is my sort of regimen, this is my routine. It becomes very hard to kind of get round that if you can sense <coughs> and see that someone's actually really struggling with their, is actually doing themselves more harm, when ostensibly what they're dealing with is healthy food types, but just not a lot of it. You know, it's really, yeah. it's, it's such a dangerous <laughs> And one. really, really being, you know, controlling to like a ridiculous mm. degree. So, you know, I, I would say little red flags there. Mm. Again, taking away from this case, but little red flags to look out for with, your, with young people because they're so susceptible. Mm. And I do think many of the wellness gurus aren't scurrilous, terrible no, 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 people, no. conning people. I think that they just really believe in it. Well, someone, here, really... someone here suggested that in a, in a weird way, if there are rules around sort of face tuning apps and not being able to say that this is really you and that there's, there should be some kind of regulation in a sense of, of offering wellness and dietary advice, you, you need to have some qualification. Mm. Far too, it's far more complex <laughs> though, isn't it, than copyright law. So mm. that's why it doesn't happen online. Um, so Erin uh, Bullimore, I have a friend that can't be vegetarian because if she starts restricting her food for one thing, she finds it hard to stop. Eating yeah. disorders can make being vegetarian or vegan very risky. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. But you can also overeat on vegan as well. I mean, I, I imagine you can also get to a point where you mistakenly think, I'm eating healthily, and then you just eat too much of stuff. Well, I've tried to be a vegan a few times, and every time I've piled on the way. Oh, there you go. That's interesting. Because <laughs> I've just had that... loads of chips. Strange. Come to restaurants and go, because I don't like the vegan option, and go, can I have some chips? Yeah. 
Well, it, it seems sensible that we kind of come off the back of this into, into we pop male body dysmorphia. I just wanted to say a huge thank you. I posted an image of a before and after um, from three plus years ago on my Instagram yesterday. So many lovely messages. Thank you so much. Um, I don't really Can post, I, just show the I don't picture? really normally post that kind of stuff at all, you know, in terms of, it wasn't show work. It was just, it, it was just a marked moment where for a glimpse of a second, I felt, that's me on the right three and a half years ago, or left, I don't know how you're seeing it. That's me today. Show the side one, the side one's better. Um, um, <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's fantastic. And when it popped can I, up... Can I just, yeah, just, sorry, just, God, just darling, carry on. Yeah, sure. Um, I don't normally post that kind of thing, but for a micro millisecond of a second, I felt, as I think I put in the comments, I put something along the lines of, I don't feel like a lean little winner, to quote Joe Wicks. I feel like a leaner runner-up, which was a nice feeling for, for that moment. And I'll probably dive back into the hell of dysmorphia today. Doesn't he look amazing? Yeah, but the one, I now, mean... Now, but, but what I wanted to say about this is... This when hasn't I been restricted see, eating either, so... When I see that one, right, that one, yeah. the, the, the one when you're bigger, when you're not as fit, let's yeah. say, I know that when... I was, when you were like that, I wasn't thinking, oh God, Mark's really part of it. Yeah, we were Mark, talking about that. I, I genuinely, I do see the person, but now when I look at the difference, yeah. I mean, I say to you every single day, I say to you, you're looking amazing because you put the work in. Mm. In the entire time he's been doing Joe Wicks, he has never not done it for a week, never. You've never missed it. Well, in the last two years I've done, since his act, I've done something like 300 and so, I mean, it's, I, but I don't overdo it. I don't go beyond the, he says three or four a week. I do pretty much four a week and I do a couple of runs. And, and it's religious. I mean, I do it for my mental... It's as, good, it's as important for my mental health. Thank you. Um, someone just said, Karen, love that joke. I know, I was really touched that he shared it. And it Joe, really, really Joe, nice. Joe sent me some messages as well. It's <laughs> so funny. Because I posted and said, oh, you know, so proud of Mark. And um, and uh, Joe Whit Joe says that he's rigged. What does that mean? I don't know what that is. Oh, he's just sent me another message. I don't know what that is, but um, it sounds really good. And he, Joe has DM'd me and said, got a great rig, rigged up, great body. <laughs> and I said, oh, I love it, honestly, and thank you, Joe. And he's put, what a role model. He's crushing it. What a hunk. I'm not going to say what that line is because no. he might not want me to say it. <laughs> And I said, yeah, he always has been. And he's, Joe said, lol, my hero. He said you called you his hero. Oh, nice. He's like, and that's not just because we're off the kind of pretend telly. That is because he does that with all, you know, he does, he messages yeah, no, people he's, across he's, the board. He's very supportive. He's such, a, he's so committed, Joe. But the thing about it that, that, it, that it did remind me is, again, you know, like I say, I will spin back down that, that body dysmorphic thing. I was most surprised by, your sister actually came in and said, yeah, more men should be doing that. Because you, Dina I mean, did. Dina's she very was quite sort of, she's not anti-man, but she's not particularly interested, as why should she be, in the, the lot of men. And she was just saying how unusual she found it was to, she felt it was to sort of see someone. And it's not comfortable. The weird thing about the photo, which was taken three, three plus years ago, was, in fact, the next home time vlog that goes out is us doing the David Beckham, um, do you remember when we lay on the floor and did the mm. Beckham kind of thing? And I looked in that footage, which is going to land this week, I look in that like I did three years ago. So whilst that photo was taken three years ago, I was in that body shape only four months ago. I have, in the last four months, and if you look at the home time from last year in Crete and Cornwall, which have just gone out, I, I was where I was in that left photo. I was there only five months ago. So in the last five months I've done, it's been the last five months I have followed the regimen of his, each of his cycles, Not none of this is an ad by the way, uh, each of his cycles religiously, you do them four times and you move on up. And I've just literally stuck with it Listen to the advice and parked in a few runs here and there. And actually, my food hasn't been as chaotic, but... But, but what I want to talk about is the dysmorphia yeah. around this because um, it is important because we talk about it so often with women. So last night, so Mark got lots of really lovely compliments. Um, and then last night, you'd had a bad day, hadn't you? And you... you you had, I don't know, 
crisps well, or chocolate no. or something. And it was just so interesting I'd to me. Love, I'd had a really good day. It was worry, so right? interesting that. to me that as we went to bed, he goes, I really picked out. Didn't I? And I thought, oh, here we go. Here's the dysmorphia coming in. Because what he's actually going to do now is he's going to go to bed saying to himself, I've ruined everything. Mm. And, and this is something that happens with dys dysmorphia that I've noticed is like, you can have a few minutes where you're feeling positive about your body image mm. and then bam, 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 five mm. punches come in mm. and knock it back down again. Mm. And this is the awful, vicious cycle that goes on with dysmorphia. It, it, it's a terribly lonely, scary way of thinking and it can overwhelm one's life it really really can and you know I've, I've struggled with it undiagnosed I never knew I had body dysmorphia I just really thought I was I just thought I was hideous mm. I didn't know that that was dysmorphic because clearly I'm not hideous but I spent all my life most of my adult life thinking that mm. and obviously I'm older than you and I'm further on with it than you um but that's what you have to be mindful of you have to be mindful of that, that those nasty demons don't come in and snatch away a moment of clarity. Because what you've had is a moment of clarity. Yeah, but it's difficult. That you, that you actually, this idea you have of yourself is so warped. And years and years and years ago, we were in Germany and we went to this, um, tell them the story about the mirrors. No, we were in, we were in, we were in Amsterdam, lean in, lean in. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody coming down the stairs. Okay, go on, you can go, it's clear. Um, we were in Amsterdam, as you can probably see from my, my head there. Um, and uh... <laughs> we went to this something oh, or other. Sorry. And there were all these. Um, the Science Museum. That's it, Science Museum. And they're uh, morning gorgeous. And um, there were all these mirrors, like, what would you call them? 360, 360 degree mirrors. And Mark went through the mirror and he had such a defining moment because he was like, oh, I'm not that hideous. Mm. <laughs> and I was like, of course you're not. You've just seen yourself the way another living, moving human being would see you. You're not staring into a mirror, looking at every detail of yourself, looking crystal. See, I'm already hating this conversation now. Self really hating it. No, 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 no. But 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 the weird thing about all of it is, You've isn't it that. isn't it weird that the thing that I posted was about having changed my body. So I felt better. It's the difficulty around the idea that theoretically we're not supposed to talk about body shaming or anything like that. But unless I felt ashamed of how my body was, I wouldn't have done something about it. But what I'm saying is I had to body the way dysmorphia myself. works is you will become ashamed in a different way. Yeah, no, I agree. You will, and so else. that's what this is the point. You've done the work and you, you look in amazing. But dysmorphia is nothing to do with the way we actually look. It's to do with the way we perceive ourselves. Mm. And that's what now you've got to be really like conscious of that mm. and just go, no, don't fucking go there. Well, Sarah Fox, I totally <laughs> recognise that behaviour, Mark. Actually, I've been discussing it with a dietitian this morning. My relationship with food is healthy, but when I eat the bad stuff, I despair of myself. Me, it's the evenings. I know if I start eating, it's a fucking... It it's just an obstacle course of hell but as the, soon as I open but, my diet. But also day. by saying the bad stuff, you're calling yourself mm. bad. Do you mm. know what I mean? Try and just omit saying bad. Okay. And just because that's when then the punishment comes in. I'm bad. It's almost like I'm mm. bad. Do you know what I mean? No, I he wants to move this conversation like Well, no, no, no. It's just I that, you know. I'm comfortable. No, 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 okay. no. But also the only, the only th tip I would give is that... So many times in the last five months when I've been doing this regimen, my voice has said, don't do it. It, it. At the times I don't want to do any kind of fitness, it's the times I absolutely, as best as I can, turn my thoughts off and just do it. Start it, because otherwise I just And I, I think just what's really important is that you're not overdoing it, because that can be something that comes in with dysmorphia. Or like, so now you could go to a place where you've had these compliments, you're looking great, and you now will get even more competitive with yourself and over-exercise. So that's mm. another no, trap yeah. one can fall yeah. into. So I agree. Yeah. OK, finally, just before we head off, um, the, the topic I think you've all been desperate to talk about, really, is ice in wine. Obviously, I don't drink wine, so I couldn't give a flying fuck about this, but Nadia does, and you often put ice in your wine, and, and some I, say it's vulgar. Well, I love this article because this is a Michelin chef... David Chang. ...saying 
It is not vulgar and it makes wine taste like gold. And um, it's a very funny article, isn't it? Have you read it about, oh God, how can you walk down the streets of Paris again? There'll be bleh, yeah, bleh, yeah, 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 and bleh. Yeah. I mean, I imagine you can't put ice or you wouldn't want to put ice in a red wine, would you? No, no. Uh, but I don't drink red wine. But my mum always says, oh, my God, how crass. She does. And she, even if that wine is at boiling point, she will not put really? ice in it. But I love putting ice in it. And I love, I have, I'm always ashamed. I think like, oh, God, everyone's going to think I'm as common as muck. But I love it. Well, because you do and in this article, it says, years ago, you know, the only way it could possibly be acceptable is if you find the grape that was that the wine was made from and then deep freeze the grape. That's what we're saying here about then, freezing, the, freezing the grape or something. Freezing right? the grape and putting the grape in the wine. But, but you know, these, they, look, these are a pound in Poundland at the moment. Huge we bollocks. About, we talked about this yesterday Huge on the bollocks. Million Sunday show. A pound. You are going to drink your wine before that is melted, so it doesn't melt down the wine. I suppose a couple of things on this that Pound. I think... I want to get... I'm going to go get a load A couple of, of things about this that I suppose is, one has to flag up. One never thinks twice about putting um, ice in spirits or other alcoholic drinks. You wouldn't put ice in beer, um, or would you? Um, the other thing is, is why, people get, why do people get so hot under the collar about it when a white wine spritzer is, is an absolutely acceptable drink, which well, I no, always no. despise. No, no, Th those despised people... Despised a white wine spritzer. Those but... people who judge somebody for putting ice in their wine also judge a white wine spritzer. Oh, okay. Well, it's maybe like that, maybe that water in wine. You know, like wine is this... Mm. But I'm not a connoisseur. You know, I, I, I just like wine that doesn't make me go... <coughs> But Dina, you know, she looks for all the florals. She's like, that wine she brought in yesterday because we did mm. the No Name Sunday show live last night. And um, that wine she was tasting, she, she said to me, oh, it's got an edge of raspberry in it. Well, when I drank it, she was bloody right. It did have an edge of raspberry, but I wouldn't have known that. And if you put, what, if you put ice in it, it just um, dilutes it, doesn't it? I suppose that's I'm the idea. I'm as common as Yeah, ice, I generally don't like ice in anything. So, for example, if I get a soft drink from somewhere like, I don't know, McDonald's or the cinema, I will always say, if it's coming out of one of the kind of, you know, the machines, I'll say, no ice. And they always look at you like you're mad. My line on that is, I don't want half of what I'm buying full of hard water if it's cold. I, I, and ice, when you drink out of a glass, gets in the way of your lip because it always bumps there and you can't get a free draft of whatever it is you're drinking. So I, I fucking hate ice. I love ice. I find it annoying as hell. Anyway. There you go. <laughs> wow. We went on a journey there today, didn't we? We, we were like, wow. Ice is not nice. <laughs> Unless you drop it down your trousers. <laughs> and that's great in hot weather. It's a great way of cooling your knackers. There you go. Yeah. And on that, we shall end. Lots of love. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if this is your first time to the channel, have a bit of a look around. There's lots going on.